Welcome to the Center for Secure Free Society's second edition of our From the Field webinar series. My name is Joseph Hulmeyer. I'm the Executive Director of the Center, or SFS as we're known in-house. For those that are new to SFS, we are the leading national security think tank in Washington, D.C., focused on something that the defense community calls trend regional threats in the Western Hemisphere. While most of the think tank community here in Washington focuses on the rest of the world, we at SFS are focused right here on our neighborhood. I'd also like to remind anyone that's new to our YouTube channel to be sure to hit the subscribe button below, as well as the little bell icon next to the subscribe button to ensure you are updated on our latest videos and notifications from SFS. And thank you once again for taking part in this important and timely discussion on the immigration and border crisis. Our new From the Field webinar series are virtual discussions that take you well beyond the border, take you to where the action is, and have important and interesting conversations and dialogue with leading national security experts from the SFS network or policy officials and practitioners from the US and our allies abroad. For this specific From the Field webinar, we're going, we're going to go to Guatemala. I visited Guatemala many times. It's a beautiful country. Uh, it's truly one of the most uh, beautiful cities, in particular Guatemala City, which some have referred to as the eternal spring because of its excellent weather. But beyond the great weather, Guatemala is a top ally and a top partner for the United States on important issues such as national security, trade, and of course, immigration. To begin our discussion, we have a special video from the Guatemalan foreign minister, Minister Pedro Brolo, who is an economist, entrepreneur, and since January of last year, January of 2020, he was appointed by the Guatemalan President Alejandro Jamate as the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Guatemala. In his video remarks, which are approximately nine minutes, Minister Brolo will give us an important message touching on various angles of the immigration challenge uh, that we have here in North America, but also in his region in Central America. He'll discuss the multilateral cooperation the Guatemalan government is or has initiated to deal with irregular migration, particularly on the human rights front. But more importantly, he's going to talk about what the Guatemalan government is doing to incentivize legal migration, to include a guest worker program that allows Guatemalans to look for legal ways to come to the United States for work, as well as the government's efforts to fight against transnational organized crime and the caravans that have exploited the immigration situation. Minister Brolo highlights that the immigration policy is a top priority for the current Guatemalan government of President Jamate, and that the minister himself has visited Dallas and McKellen, Texas uh, recently to see our border situation. As I mentioned earlier, Guatemala is a top partner and a top ally for the United States. And for that reason, here at the Center for Secure Free Society, we are pleased and honored that Minister Brolo sent us the following video remarks. Señor Joseph Umire, Director Ejecutivo del Centro para una Sociedad Libre y Segura. Honorables señores, quisiera iniciar agradeciendo su presencia en este importante encuentro que nos permitirá sostener un diálogo franco y abierto sobre temas de interés regional en materia migratoria. Es para mí un honor participar como orador en este evento virtual organizado por el Centro para una Sociedad Libre y Segura. Deseo compartirles que para el gobierno de Guatemala, dirigido por el presidente Alejandro Yamatei, una de sus prioridades es el tema migratorio. Y por ello, dentro de la política exterior de Guatemala, uno de los ejes se ha enfocado en la atención integral de nuestros connacionales en el exterior y de sus familias. Siendo nuestra región uno de los corredores migratorios más transitados a nivel mundial. Para Guatemala, este tema es primordial para la ejecución de acciones enfocadas en la protección de los derechos humanos de las personas migrantes y más aún, para la generación de oportunidades que permitan fomentar muros de prosperidad, para que la migración se convierta en una opción y no en una necesidad. Es por ello que deseo compartirles las acciones que ha realizado el gobierno de Guatemala con el fin de abordar de manera integral el tema migratorio. Durante el mes de febrero del año 2020, 
Se firmó un acuerdo con el alto comisionado de las Naciones Unidas para los Refugiados, ACNUR, la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones, OIM, y el Fondo de las Naciones Unidas para la Infancia, UNICEF, con el objetivo de implementar mecanismos de trabajo para elaborar una hoja de ruta que permita diseñar, implementar y optimizar acciones y mecanismos que garanticen el respeto de los derechos humanos de las personas migrantes, prestando especial atención a los derechos humanos de los grupos vulnerables, como lo son las niñas, niños y adolescentes, mujeres, víctimas de delitos como la trata de personas y el tráfico ilícito de migrantes y de las personas con necesidad de protección internacional. Gracias a este mecanismo, durante el cierre provocado por la pandemia, se han implementado acciones para garantizar el retorno digno y seguro de guatemaltecos desde los Estados Unidos de América y los Estados Unidos mexicanos, bajo el estricto cumplimiento de protocolos sanitarios conjuntamente con la OIM. De igual manera, bajo esta perspectiva de cooperación, el Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores impulsó acciones en torno a atención y protección de los grupos más vulnerables, que deciden migrar como las niñas, niños y adolescentes migrantes con el acompañamiento del Fondo de las Naciones Unidas para la Infancia UNICEF. Asimismo, en colaboración con la Oficina del Alto Comisionado de las Naciones Unidas para los Refugiados, se han posicionado temas relacionados al refugio con el afán de garantizar la atención de las personas con necesidad de protección internacional. De esta cuenta, hemos recibido la visita de altos funcionarios del ACNUR como la reciente visita de la señora Kelly Clements, comisionada adjunta, con quien se sostuvo un diálogo ameno y enriquecedor sobre los temas de fortalecimiento de los sistemas de refugio, admisión, recepción y procesamiento de personas con necesidades de protección y nuestro deseo de fortalecer la integración local de personas refugiadas, en especial en materia de documentación, trabajo, acceso a programas, entre otras necesidades básicas para su desarrollo. Me complace compartirles que este año Guatemala ostenta la presidencia pro tempore del Marco Integral Regional para la Protección y Soluciones MIRPS. Durante la audiencia que tuvimos con la alta comisionada adjunta, se reconoció la labor de Guatemala y los avances en las acciones contempladas en el Plan de Trabajo Regional 2021. Dentro de las acciones de nuestro Plan de Trabajo, se encuentra el desarrollo del evento de solidaridad organizado por el Gobierno de España en coordinación con la Presidencia Pro Tempore MIRPS 2021 de Guatemala y la Presidencia Pro Tempore del SICA a cargo de Costa Rica y el apoyo de ACNUR y la OEA como Secretaría Técnica del MIRPS. En este evento de solidaridad se pretende canalizar apoyo de amplio rango de estados, instituciones financieras internacionales, sector privado, organismos regionales, y otros actores que proveen a las personas protección y soluciones bajo el espíritu de responsabilidad compartida establecido en el Pacto Mundial para Refugiados. Por otra parte, nuestra región se ha visto marcada por desafíos actuales que se han presentado en los flujos migratorios de nuestros países y sobre todo los que involucran a niñas, niños y adolescentes. Por ello, que hace unos días realicé una visita oficial a las ciudades de Dallas, y McAllen, Texas, en Estados Unidos de América, con el fin de visitar los albergues y conocer de primera mano la situación de niñas, niños y adolescentes no acompañados. Asimismo, pude reunirme con autoridades para abordar esta problemática a quienes manifesté la preocupación por la integridad física y psicológica de este sector de la población. El gobierno de Guatemala, consciente de la necesidad de crear programas que incentive la migración segura, ordenada y regular, implementó el Programa de Trabajadores Temporales Migrantes, mediante el cual los ciudadanos guatemaltecos cuentan con una alternativa confiable que les permite acceder a plazas de trabajo en el extranjero, teniendo la certeza que volverán a su tierra y con sus familias, promoviendo y evitando al mismo tiempo que se afecte el tejido social. Es importante trabajar de la mano con las autoridades estadounidenses, mexicanas y centroamericanas, en lanzar mensajes de prevención armonizados, claros y contundentes, destinados a revertir la interpretación errónea que han transmitido traficantes de personas migrantes, como las denominadas caravanas. En ese sentido, la República de Guatemala, con los países de la región, ha forjado una relación especial diplomática 
con agendas bilaterales dinámicas y complejas que han significado a su vez grandes oportunidades y retos. Por otra parte, Guatemala y México abordan la temática de seguridad por medio del Grupo de Alto Nivel de Seguridad, con el objetivo de unificar esfuerzos para combatir la delincuencia y el crimen organizado y desarrollar esquemas de cooperación para atender y fortalecer las condiciones de seguridad bajo un enfoque integral. Reconocemos la importancia del trabajo conjunto con los Estados Unidos de América como uno de nuestros principales socios estratégicos, así como contar con la cooperación y coordinación para abordar de manera integral las causas y raíz de la migración irregular, lo cual coadyuvará en mantener unidas a las familias, aumentar la resiliencia de nuestras sociedades y crear un futuro más próspero para todos. Aunado a ello, es de vital importancia que los procesos migratorios sean seguros, ordenados y regulares, y se vele por la seguridad y bienestar de las personas migrantes. Para finalizar, quiero reiterar mi agradecimiento y felicitar a todos los participantes por fomentar espacios de diálogo sostenibles en materia migratoria. Sabemos que aún hay desafíos que debemos enfrentar. Si bien la situación ha mejorado, el camino es largo. Y es por ello que el gobierno de Guatemala está comprometido en continuar trabajando por el bienestar de las personas migrantes. Muchas gracias. Thank you once again to the Guatemalan Foreign Ministry, to Minister Pedro Brolo, and to the entire government of President Jamate in Guatemala for sending us these special video remarks. It's a positive message, and I particularly like the theme of secure, orderly, and regular, meaning legal, migration that the minister highlighted throughout the video. And with that, we're going to turn now to our additional guest speakers for this webinar. Then let me turn to a good friend, uh, a, a good political analyst, a writer, uh, someone that specializes on uh, many issues, a multidimensional area of issues, including international relations, national security, and, and international trade, especially the geopolitical context of international trade, which is Rennie Bake. Uh, Rennie Bake is an alumnus of the William J. Perry Center, which is essentially like the counterpart for the National uh, Institute for Strategic Studies in Guatemala. She's uh, also a, uh, an advisor, or has been an advisor to several Guatemalan officials, including the foreign minister and the chief of staff to the Guatemalan army. Uh, she also hosts a popular uh, radio show in Guatemala on a, on a program on a network called Libertopolis. It's a popular podcast uh, dedicated to foreign policy with a very cool name called El Patio de Atrás, which essentially means our backyard, but it's not in the, in the US context, our backyard. It's we're in Guatemala's backyard, uh, in that sense, being from the United States. So, Renny, thank you again uh, for joining us. It's a pleasure to see you, at least virtually. And uh, thank you again for, for being on our webinar. Thank you, Yosef. It's a pleasure to be here. And hello, Francisco. I think we will have a very interesting conversation about Guatemala. Guatemala is the new border of the USA, as usually I, I tell you. And yes, maybe in the USA, they think Guatemala is the backyard of the USA, but we do a joke. USA is the big backyard of the Guatemalans. Exactly, exactly, we're the big backyard, or maybe the front yard, who knows how we can, how we look at, depends how we look at that. So let, let me give a little context to our discussion today. So approximately two months ago, we had a conversation here on our channel with SFS uh, from the field about the impending border crisis. This is probably one of the top issues in the country right now, particularly for national security, but also for political policy, but also for uh, immigration, obviously. And we had a great conversation with two uh, excellent national security experts based in Texas. You can actually find that video on our YouTube channel and watch it. Uh, but at the time, we thought the situation was pretty bad. And at the time, according to the numbers that we were looking from the Department of Homeland Security, uh, there were more than 100,000 apprehensions of undocumented migrants on our southwest border, which is about 3,300 per day, give or take, which is well above the, the numbers that our immigration security infrastructure on the border can handle. So that was uh, essentially uh, two months ago when we had that conversation. We were talking about a crisis. 
We're talking about how overwhelming that crisis was with our border infrastructure. So here we are two months later, and now I regret to inform you the situation on the border has gotten worse. According to Customs and Border Patrol, which is the primary government agency in the United States in charge of border security, part of the Department of Homeland Security, the apprehensions of undocumented migrants at the border has jumped from 100,000 two months ago to 178,622 in the month of April. Are they available yet? But we'll see if that number has increased. That is an approximately 6,000 uh, apprehensions per day, which is well above the ability that our border uh, in, in border security and immigration security infrastructure was ever designed to handle. So this has prompted the Biden administration to become much more active on the issue. They've appointed a, a special envoy for the northern countries of Central America, which are Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. It's a, a long-serving uh, and long-time U.S. diplomat named Ricardo Zuniga, who had previously served as a consul general in Brazil. He had also served in the National Security Council in the previous Obama administration. Uh, he was actually born in Honduras, so he knows Central America very well. So he's a uh, well well qualified in the sense of having a long history with uh, the U.S. State Department, and so he is now the special envoy uh, for the United States to uh, the Northern Triangle of Central America. But more importantly, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris has now become the Biden administration's point person for the border crisis. Uh, Vice President Harris has had a couple calls with Guatemala's President Alejandro Giamate in late March and in late April, and is now going to arrive in Guatemala City for the first high-level state visit by a U.S. official to Guatemala, particularly by the Biden-Harris administration, since they took office in January. This is a visit that has high expectations, not just among policymakers here in Washington, but among the general American public, especially in the border states of Texas, Arizona, California, and others who are receiving an overwhelming surge in immigration, uh, both uh, uh, asylum cases, but also in undocumented immigration, and, uh, and as well, an impending uh, crisis of narcotics, which some have called the silent pandemic, because it's been growing along our border. So with that context, let's jump into the conversation with my two guests. And I'm gonna start uh, with uh, the Colonel. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, so we have this, I, I just laid out the situation here in the United States. Uh, we see our border uh, overwhelmed. We see our infrastructure weakened. Well, we see a crisis on our border. Uh -huh. uh, is this the same perspective that you have in Guatemala with your borders. Now, Guatemala has several borders as well. It has a border with Mexico, border with Honduras, a border with Salvador, and a smaller border with Belize, a smaller country in Central America. Mm -hmm. What is the current situation of Guatemala's border? Do you see it the same way that we see it here in the United States, or is it different? Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I think that uh, the people, uh, not only from Guatemala, uh, also the, from Honduras, El Salvador, and other countries uh, for the, in the search for the American dreams, always uh, is uh, the motive for the thousands of people every day try to cross the borders, principally in Guatemala. Uh, the, uh, we need to remember that the universal alternative is the focal point for the, uh, for the emergency and principally is the basis for the uh, migrant caravans. Since October 9, uh, 2018, uh, this phenomenon uh, uh, principally uh, is located in the Northern Triangle of Central America. Uh, in this fact, for try to cross Guatemala, having a target for the border with Mexico and get closer increasingly to the United States. This social dynamic generates humanitarian crisis and chaos in the security of the nation for these countries. Uh, in addition, this phenomenon also becomes a media focal point that goes around the world. Every day, a lot of kind of reasons force men, women, young men, children, elders to try to cross the border. This uh, situation also uh, has been aggravated for the impact of for the hurricanes uh, Eta and Yota, 
in, in 2020. Uh, in addition, the emergency for the pandemic, uh, for the uh, COVID-19, this uh, a lot of uh, reason. In the case for the border in Guatemala, uh, we need to remember in the beginning of this year, uh, it, we was expected around in the first uh, migrant caravan, around uh, 15,000 people could live to, uh, to, to try to cross uh, and then Guatemala and authorities prepare a contingency plan for face this possible fact. Uh, in, uh, actually, uh, we know that in the first uh, migrant caravan, uh, only uh, around 7,000 people tried to cross. Uh, the, the, the plan that uh, the Guatemalan authorities um, in fact, um, realize in this moment and is, is still is uh, okay. We have a, a one a agreement in Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua for the cross the countries only when the the, uh, the document that we say the um, uh, individual uh, document for identification and the agreement is called CIA 4. In this case, we strong the measures for the for the for the, the migrants. Uh, we need to uh, to uh, they show um, a, a test, a negative test for the COVID-19. Uh, if uh, they have a document for identification and they have the, the, the test negative, okay, they can to, to cross. But this, this fact only for the, the show, the, the test negative is a principal reason for the people, okay, uh, I prefer not go to, the, to try to cross. Well uh, Colonel Huron, you brought up a lot of interesting points, and I'm actually glad you brought up the caravans from 2018. 2018. So, uh, in full disclosure, I had a, uh, I was in Guatemala in October of 2018 when uh, those initial caravans emerged, and I know we've seen caravans since then. And I, I'd like to go to Rennie with this question because, um, well, you were with me in Guatemala when, when, when we saw this first uh, surge of caravans happening in October 2018, which essentially led to uh, a smaller but yet equally important immigration surge and border crisis in 2019 for the previous administration, for the Trump administration. Uh, however, uh, the pandemic, I think, quelled that quite a bit since all the borders were closed for most of 2020, but now we're seeing a return. So, Renny, I have two questions for you related to the caravans. The first is, what is the most important lesson that the Guatemalans have learned in terms of this phenomenon of Central American caravans that have been essentially begun since October 2018. Is that a normal form of migration? Is that irregular? Is that abnormal? If it is abnormal, what are the irregular aspects of it? And then the second part is, why haven't we seen more caravans since then? I know we've seen some, but maybe not to that level of intensity as we've seen before. So ready the question on the caravans uh, for you. Well, <laughs> if you, you, you hear when suddenly the caravans uh, was just uh, nobody knew and the next day everybody was seeing the caravans. First the caravans into 2018, I thought was organized. The people belongs to more urban areas and you saw many groups of people walking together trying to go to the USA. That broken all the rules about illegal migrants to the USA because the smugglers of illegal people saw this, what is this? They were losing their business because they make money bringing the people to the border. And second, obviously, if everybody was seeing the caravans, everybody, especially in the border of the USA, they will know they will arrive. 
that is the first uh, difference. Why we are not seeing caravans in this moment? First, I think is the COVID. Second, I think the people going to the USA is a little different than the people from the caravan in 2018. First, in the caravans 2018, you can see many men, less women, less children. No, you can see more children, more women, and you are seeing more unaccompanied child, children or minor to the USA. This is a little the difference. And another difference, you can see, for example, the people know is more from the rural areas, as the Colonel Giron said. We had Eta and Iota, these hurricanes destroyed many crops, not just in Honduras, in Guatemala too. I think maybe between seven to eight percent of the Guatemalan people, especially from the rural areas, suffer from this natural disaster and they have nothing in this moment. And at the same time, they are seeing, oh, in the USA, the new government, the Democrats, the Biden, maybe they will be more friendly with us and they started to walk to the USA. But I think the big difference no, is we are seeing more children without any relatives going to the USA because they have the opportunity because the parents in the USA think they will be received by the US government. It's, a, it's an issue of opportunity. The children are here, maybe the father, maybe the mother, maybe both parents are in the USA. And the people, especially the parents are seeing, oh, maybe the moment we can reunite the family. I think is the difference with, between the caravans we saw two, three years ago and no. Okay, Randy, I wanna stick with that a little bit with the with the children. And actually I have another question on the caravans for you and then, and then I'll turn to uh, the Colonel. But first on the children, uh, we, we hear the term that we use is the unaccompanied children uh, that arrive at the border. How much of this is um, a natural aspect to the migration patterns? Or how much is stemmed from rhetoric, essentially? Um, you know, some people here in the United States have attributed to the rhetoric of the Biden administration, particularly the president himself, about talking about the, uh, the the border, talking about immigration in a way that allows smugglers to then manipulate perhaps his words, but nonetheless use his words to be able to talk to migrants and say, look, the border's open, the border's free, we can get you there, especially if you have a child. How much is the rhetoric a part of the business of taking uh, unaccompanied children from Central America to the U.S. border? Well, maybe if you remember, uh, Joseph, before I usually be a teacher at the university and in 2014, when the first unaccompanied minor crisis blow in uh, the, the USA border, I was doing a research about the remittances from USA to the Guatemalans and I was I, well, it's a very long history, but I went to the border, the Mexican border, to talk with some smugglers, and they were telling the people, it's the moment you can send your child or your teenagers to the USA because they will have the chance to have papers to documents because they will be a chance or opportunity if you have a child in the USA, you can asked by some papers is what they were telling to the people. I was, well, I traveled maybe 10 hours uh, by car, by bus and almost by horse to talk with some uh, these smugglers and they saw these opportunities for the children and the people in the USA. By that moment, they were receiving $5,000 by adult people to bring to the border of USA. It was a child will be between eight to ten thousand dollars. I think now it's more expensive, but the people was paying, and that was the origin of the first unaccompanied, unaccompanied minor crisis in the USA border six years ago, seven years ago. Now you can see a mix. You have the COVID with the children here and teenagers 
with no school because our school are closed. With the families, maybe it's the grandmother or the grandfather or the grandfather or an, an out all the day in the house and a very poor conditions. And the parents are seeing, oh my God, my child is there, is doing nothing. And at the same time, the government of USA change, they think the Biden government will accept these children. And obviously it's an, it's an issue of opportunity. The children are doing nothing here because they are not going to the school because we don't have signs for the teachers and se or the children or teenagers. And second, the parents there are in the USA and I think, and I, they are thinking is the moment they can come here because will be, you can see it's not just the political issue, it's a business. The smugglers and the drug dealers are doing money with this issue. And why I'm mentioning drug, uh, drug dealers? In many cases, these people going to the USA are from the rural areas. Many of them with a very lack of opportunities there with interesting geographical position in the border with Mexico. This land, especially a place like a place named Huehuetenango, San Marcos, you can use the land to crops of uh, cocaine or um, amapola, heroin. I don't, I cannot remember the, the word in uh, in, Spanish, in, in, um, in English, but you must remember in this moment, these people is leaving everything here. They are risking their property. Maybe the, the only thing they have is their small piece of land, but they are taking money, borrow, to send their children to the USA. And then the drug dealer can take, if they don't pay this borrow, they can take the land. And this land will be used or are using to crops like coca, coca, coca or amapola seeds. Um, no, that's a really interesting point, Renny, in the sense that that um, kind of like a uh, uh, give and take with the drug cartels who use this whole industry of human smuggling, migration, irregular migration, but use it to benefit uh, and leverage their uh, bigger intentions perhaps on uh, drug trafficking, to be able to take land from poor people, to use it for coca crop uh, production or, or whatever kind of uh, uh, efforts that they need to be able to be have a greater production of, of narcotics. Which actually leads to my next question, which I'd like to ask to Colonel Hiron, because uh, one of the angles of this, which rennie has been talking about, and one of the angles that at the center we're, we're also looking at is the narcotics angle, because it's not just people that are crossing our border. Uh, there's obviously narcotics as well. Um, and in that, um, how do you see the drug trafficking networks in Central America as a whole? Uh, do you see that combining uh, with the uh, human smuggling facilitators, which is in uh, national security lexicon, perhaps two different forms of transnational organized crime? Uh, or do you see these as separate phenomena? And how big is this a problem for Guatemala, the narcotics element? Okay, thank you. Uh I think that uh, Remy uh, say a uh, focal point. The, um, the most important, we need to recognize that the issue of immigration is linked with the issue of uh, uh, illicit criminal uh, networks. For example, uh, the area that uh, she said uh, in the border with Mexico, the, in the west or from Guatemala, is this a special area for the trafficking, for the narcotic, uh, the coca crops, the opium, uh, also for the um, that uh, that uh, a lot of uh, flies uh, try to to landing in the areas from Guatemala and cross by uh, by road the, with the with the drugs for cross to the to the Mexico. Then. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of illicit criminal networks working with the with the illicit criminal uh, gangs for for say this this uh, this this way uh, the coyotes the coyotes also this is a different uh, kind of organization but uh, they make also um, a deals 
with uh, with the, with the trafficant. Uh, this is very easy in in a lot of uh, uh, kilometers in the border Guatemala Mexico uh, to find uh, blind crosses. Uh, the people uh, in the farms uh, in this uh, side is uh, Guatemala, and another side in the, the, the same farm is Mexico. This is my land. I, I can to make a, a, a different uh, activities, say the, the, the owners. Uh, I think the, uh, that, um, that the problem uh, involved that not only the, uh, the human crisis is also for the money crisis, because uh, uh, work together uh the smuggling the um, the human trafficking that uh, uh, okay the different uh, um, social uh, problems uh, robbery theft uh delinquency uh, the organized crime and terrorism work together in this area then the more security measures are proposed for uh, for the countries, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. But uh, it's expensive measures, but in this ambitious measure, for because this is the, the great risk that the migrants run by involuntary financing organized, organized crime businesses. The National Agenda for Risk and Treatment uh, 2021 say that the um the the illegal migration for guatemala is a problem to be of great uh impact for the country same uh then the phenomenon of, of irregularly massive migratory flows uh accompany the a lot of uh, fact for crime organized uh the example is uh, the, the trafficking, mm -hmm. uh, uh, also the smuggling, and okay, and a lot of uh, issues that accompany the principal problem that is the migration, the illegal immigration. Uh, I think that's an excellent point because I think one of the things that gets lost here in the conversation because there's there's this kind of his focus, his effort to find the root causes. That's the term that the Biden administration has used in trying to solve the immigration challenge, is what are the root causes as to why uh, so many migrants are fleeing uh, their countries in Central America uh, in their march up to the United States. And one of the things that I think is lost in that analysis is that uh, beyond corruption, beyond uh, insecurity, uh, beyond a uh, lack of economic opportunity, all these things, uh, those are more symptoms of, of something that's a little bit more deeper it is illicit economies and, and the illicit economies kind of bring all these different kind of illicit activities together whether it's drug trafficking human smuggling arms trafficking terrorist movements and something that might have think are, are kind of different in many respects right they're different commodities they're different uh uh products they're different uh in the case of terrorism and organized crime different phenomenons but the illicit economies are essentially the lifeblood that allows all this to kind of exist in the same ecosystem. And so how do you talk, tackle the illicit economies? It's a different question than just looking at corruption or some of the other things. But uh, in, you know, we're running a little bit uh, low on time. So I'd like to give a final question, Colonel, to you. And this is probably the most important question. And the question is for both of you, but I'm gonna start with uh, Colonel Hiron, which is the vice president is going to be landing in Guatemala. She's going to be meeting with President Jamate. They've already had a few conversations. What are your expectations for uh, the United States for this visit from Vice President Harris to Guatemala? What do you think the United States could be doing to help more to mutually solve this challenge of uh, irregular uh, and illegal migration? And, and what's the most important area that the United States can do right now with Guatemala to reduce the, the flows of illegal and irregular migration to both our borders. So, uh, Dr. Hiron, I'll go with you first. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, we need to, to remember that uh, historically, 
in Guatemala, the people seem to, the, to be used to the immigration for, to find employment, for example. For a long time, they have emigrated to farms or cities. Today, most are heading to the United States. Uh, this is the fact. For in this case, this is a, a real challenge that we have because um, the the problem uh, of the illegal migration is also um, uh, or has an uh, economic level because uh, a lot of people on the comment uh, migration uh, that stay uh, in in floating in in Guatemala, for example. Uh, is involved in different uh, uh, factors of crime organized, for example. In this case, uh, many people, experts say that um, uh, talk about the, the, um, the this, this phenomenon, uh, the causes uh, are diverse because a uh, long time, a long period of uh, lack of real own and share regional public policies to promote the development of societies, for example, poverty, famine, wars, extreme violence, effect of natural disasters. In Guatemala, say that begin the, 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 the flux uh, very strong uh, after the one phenomenon, uh, the natural phenomenon, the in 19. 76, the, the earthquake, and also for the violence in the internal armed conflict in the 80s, for example. Uh, the poverty is increased in Guatemala. No, this is the most important is try to, the, that, for example, the United States increase the opportunities for investment more investment in Guatemala, for example. And this, uh, uh, this is a, the, the important fund for create a new employers. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a big proponent of foreign investment over foreign aid. Uh, you know, there's a lot of foreign aid that's often thrown to developing countries all throughout the world, but also in Central America. Uh, but the money doesn't always find its way uh, in, in the most productive way that actually helps the country. Sometimes it actually finds its way to political causes that actually hurt the country. Uh, but foreign investment's different, right? Foreign investment or private sector, business uh, uh, development, uh, entrepreneurs uh, kind of uh, putting their businesses into Guatemala, which that's, I think, much more productive than uh, a government transfer from 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 uh, foreign aid. But let me, let me turn to now to Rennie, uh, kind of to wrap this up. And the same similar question, uh, but more specifically on the visit of the Vice President Harris, because this is an important visit. I mean, this is, in my opinion, uh, this is probably the most important visit, the most important trip that uh, the Biden administration is going to have. Uh, and this can uh, go many different ways. But when uh, Vi Vice President Harris returns to the United States, there have to be some tangible results. She cannot come back empty handed. Um, what is your expectation for her visit? Um, maybe even some concerns if you think that this is my conversation may go in a different direction. Uh, what, where would you like to see this ha uh, go? Or what are your concerns? And, and how do you think this visit is going to uh, um, result with with the, the visit of Vice President Harris to Guatemala? Well, first, we must understand uh, part of this migration to the USA is a family issue. In this country, everybody has a family, a family, a relative, a friend living in the USA, legal or illegal. In this moment, 30% of uh, our people are receiving remittance from the USA. What I could be expect from the, the visit of uh, the Vice President Harris, I will answer in two words. TPS for our people in the USA, and second, vaccine for COVID. Why these two things? First, these people in the USA, maybe they have five, 10, 20 years without visit due to their children here, to the parents here. And if they can have TPS, 
they can visit and they can have more familiar relation, close relation. We have remember a geopolitical thing. We are the only country in Guatemala, in, in Central America, that means Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, in Nicaragua. I am not talking about Costa Rica because they are not member of the central market. We don't have TPS. El Salvador, El Salvador have TPS, Honduras have TPS, Nicaragua have TPS. And we are the only country with no TPS for our people in the USA. Second, Russia and El Salvador is, well, they are the new, new, the new best friends, Russia, China, and El Salvador. They are very close to the USA. We are the only country from the South border, the president Yamate from Guatemala is the only person in the South border who is not with the Chinese or are not talking with China. And Russia is a little uh, not close. We must understand Guatemala is key for the national security of the USA. Second, vaccines. Why? Because we have a lot of problems to find vaccines for COVID in this moment. The market is very complicated and the USA have millions of vaccines. If you send vaccines to us, we can move more easy our economy. We can give vaccines to the teachers and the children come back to the school. That means a normal life again in some way. And third, I think if the, if, uh, the Vice President Kamala Harris will come, I hope she will come here with if she will bring money to you to aid, and, uh, and uh, I think as you, Joseph, I think trade, no aid is what we need. If they keep, if you will give money to the Guatemalans, please remember three things. Support with respect and audit. Support what means you will help, help us in what we need, not what thing you, we will need. Second, respect. We have difference in culture, especially cultural difference, and that is very important. If you don't understand, like an example, oh, the US government once promotes the abortion, you will have the religious groups here, the 90% of the population against the US government, and the people loves the USA, but sometimes issues like this can provoke many problems. And third, audit, if you give money to the NGO, so the government audit every second, every penny, because it's not money to do anything, it's to do the things. The US government is giving the money with some purpose. If there's a message that uh, the Vice President Harris could have, this would be my advice to her if I was to speak to her, would be to come down with a message, and you said it, Rennie, to, to come down with a message of trade, not aid. Uh, that looking to partner with Guatemala to create foreign investment, more uh, international trade, uh, and not necessarily uh, just money, just pouring money at the problem because that hasn't proven to work in the past. A couple quick things on some of the things you mentioned. I 100% agree with the audit. A lot of the money that comes to Guatemala from foreign aid often finds its ways into all kinds of different circles. Some of that's very unproductive, both for the Guatemalan government, but also for U.S. national security because it finds its way to illicit actors. So that's a proven case with uh, many of the many many of these cases of foreign aid. So the audit, I think, is important. Independent audit, I would say, an audit that's not done just by the same people that are issuing the money. Uh, and then lastly, on the TPS issue, the, the challenge with TPS, Rennie, is that uh, is the T, uh, because oftentimes it's meant to be temporary. Uh, but you know, we've seen with Salvador and other cases, it becomes almost permanent. And so we have a challenge with keeping the T. Uh, uh, honest on the TPS, and, and we may be able to visit that issue. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, I'd love to be able to talk with uh, both the Colonel, both with Rennie, uh, for hours, but unfortunately, we have a, a bit of limited time. Well, thank you once again to everyone for taking part in our second edition of the From the Field webinar series. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank our guest speakers. I thank once again Minister Brolo and, and the Guatemalan Foreign Ministry for the video remarks. And, and I also especially thank the audience uh, for taking part. Uh, this is a reminder also to uh, subscribe to our YouTube page, uh, hit the notifications button. Uh, we're going to have additional videos and an additional from the field webinar in the near future. I also like to uh, provide you with additional publications from the Center for Security Society, 
We recently published a VRIC monitor, which is a bulletin, a monthly bulletin that examines the presence and activities of Russia, Iran, and China in Latin America. Uh, you can find the VRIC monitor on our website. And we've also recently published a new situation report on the crisis in Colombia that's also available for download uh, or for reading on our website. Uh, again, thank, thank you once again for participating. Be sure to follow us on social media, uh, subscribe to our YouTube page, and visit our website, securefreesociety.org. Uh, until next time, thank you once again.